Hello, good evening and welcome here tonight to uh, a very special 5 by 15 with George Monbiot and also with Franny Armstrong. George Monbiot, as many of you know, because he's no stranger to 5 by 15, has just written an extraordinary book called Regenesis, which is about fixing our farming and food system. It's seriously the truth to say that this could not be more topical. This is a week when we have seen the government produce a white paper in response to the food strategy that at best can be called a little bit limp. It is a week and a time when we're seeing an enormous food crisis coming as a result of the war in Ukraine, when pressures on world food supplies and the way we feed ourselves and indeed the way we farm is under scrutiny as never before. George's book lifts the lid on pretty much all of this, from the soil that's under our feet to the corporations that run the food world that we live in. But much more than that, he also, he also produces very interesting alternatives, which we will come on to in the course of the next hour. So just some housekeeping rules. Please ask questions, put them in the Q&A box, and we're going to try and allow as much time as possible. The event is going to be as follows, that George and I will talk for about 15, 20 minutes, then we're going to play Franny Armstrong's new film, which is about the book and about George. And you'll see that at that point, we sort of change the tone of what we're going to be talking about. Franny Armstrong is the wonderful filmmaker who made The Age of Stupid. And last year, she and George collaborated on Riverside, which we also launched on 5 by, on 5 by 15, which looked at the situation in the River Wye, another dire situation, primarily, almost exclusively, caused by the kind of food systems that we're stuck with right now. Details of Franny's film and indeed the book Regenesis and where to buy it from our bookseller will be in the chat. So with fur no further ado, I'm delighted to welcome George here tonight to join us. And George, this is a really, really splendid book and your subline is feeding the world without devouring the planet, which is what everybody really wants to be able to do now. So. I've got so many questions for you, but I think I'd like to start with something that struck me very strongly in your book, which was about our, our sort of strange relationship to farming in that we romanticize it as old MacDonald had a farm and sort of fields of wheat and that everything about farming somehow is sold to us as benign. And therefore, when you actually read your book, it's truly shocking to find out what's going on. Thank you, Rosie. Yes, there is a sort of moral force field thrown around the farming industry, which means that we don't apply the same standards that we would apply to any other industry when looking at its environmental impacts, social impacts, um, all the other things that it does. And one of the questions I asked myself before I started work on this book was, what would it look like if we were to apply the same standards, if we were to um, look at farming as any other industry and see what it does? And what we see is that it is by far the most environmentally destructive industry on earth. It's the worst thing we've ever done to the planet. And we don't like to see it that way because of course we depend on farming, but also there are these deep myths, these root metaphors that saturate our culture, that tell us that farming is good and benign and everything it does is good and benign. And amazingly, many of them, in fact, most of them revolve around the livestock farm. So if you think about a huge proportion of the books for very young children, for infants who haven't yet learnt to read, uh, almost 50%, it seems to me, are about livestock farms, but not a livestock farm of, of the kind that actually produces any of the food we eat. There's one rosy cheek farmer and there's one cow and one horse and one pig and one chicken and one cat and one dog, and they all talk to each other. And there's no indication of why they might be there or what might happen to them, obviously. Um, and so it creates this ideal of the livestock farm as this safe haven, this place of safety and comfort. Now, when I was uh, a teenager, I worked for a few months on an intensive pig farm. And that really sort of sowed the seed of curiosity about our food system, because there were two thoughts which kept hitting me again and again, day after day when I was working on it. One, this isn't what they told me it was. Mm -hmm. It bears no relationship to what uh, we're told farming is and two why is this legal and 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 as I began to explore farming in, in much more depth obviously in the book there is something I've sort of dipped in and out of throughout the whole 37 years I've been working on these issues um, it 
I was hit by those thoughts again and again and again, that there's so much about this industry that we don't see, we don't want to see, that if any other industry were doing it, would be straight up illegal. Yes, I think that's um, amazing. Also, when you think about this, you start the book by talking about the magic that's under our feet mm. and the soil. And I always find if I go to like the big wheat fields in the centre of England or East Anglia, and actually, instead of it being a beautiful green field, in fact, you're looking at a kind of factory because mm. if you stand still, you realise there's no birds, there's no hedges, there's nothing but miles of wheat and it's completely sterile. And yet again, we have a fantasy about that. So tell us about what we have done to the soil in mm. really, I suppose, the, you know, since the end of the Second World War, isn't it, that we got yeah. really destructive to soil? I, I think it starts with our failure to recognise soil for what it is, which is mm -hmm. an ecosystem. In fact, one of the most diverse and abundant ecosystems on Earth. And, and even more than that, a biological structure. It's an ecosystem created by the organisms that live in it, starting with bacteria, building their little chambers out of soil carbon, which they turn into cement and mineral particles, and then the slightly bigger creatures which build their chambers out of bacterial chambers, and then the soil giants like ants and worms, which build their chambers out of those slightly bigger chambers, uh, which means it has the same uh, structure, whatever magnification you look at it, gives it great structural resilience. Um, but the whole thing is built by organisms. If, they, if, if there weren't creatures in the soil, there would be no soil. There would be no soil for there to be creatures in. They, they, they've created this in the same way that creatures create coral reefs, and that's what it is. It's basically a sort of terrestrial coral reef, rich with symbiotic relationships, with, with structured and less structured zones, a self-regulating ecosystem, very much like a coral reef. And we've totally ignored and neglected that and treated it as just, well, something for plants to, to stand up in, which we'll slap fertilizer on top of. Uh, but actually it's the soil itself, uh, it's the life of the soil which delivers much of the fertility. In fact, we now know that soil fertility is as much a, a product of its biology as, as of its chemistry. Um, the plants rely on bacteria and fungi to deliver minerals to them, but also to protect them from disease, to fire up their immune systems, to um, produce growth hormones for them. Um, the, in fact, the, the soil immediately surrounding a root hair is almost identical in structure and function to the human gut. It, it, it is effectively the plant's external gut. But by neglecting all this and by assuming that we can just use it almost as if it were like a hydroponic sponge where we just sort of slap stuff on it and plants will use that stuff to grow, we've actually gone a long way towards destroying it. When, when you um, put a whole load of nitrogen fertilizer on soil, it can cause the bacteria in the soil to burn through the carbon, which is the cement that sticks everything together. Soil structure then collapses. It can become waterlogged, airless, hard for roots to penetrate. You can actually make the soil less fertile, fertile by putting too much fertilizer on it, paradoxically. A lot of the pesticides we use kill many of the crucial soil animals on, on which we depend. And of course, continued plowing, and other treatments, particularly subsoiling, they're very, very damaging to soil structure. Now, we might not notice these changes um, from year to year. We might not see very much going on in the soil. Crops will continue to be grown. But because soil is a complex system and complex systems have tipping points, you can push it and push it and push it and it absorbs that stress until suddenly it passes a critical threshold and collapses, and that's called a dust bowl. And when a dust bowl happens is when you've got a degraded soil hit by a major drought, erosion rates rise 6,000 fold virtually overnight, and you get a whole fertile bread basket just blowing away in the wind. So that's what we saw in Oklahoma, obviously, and it's what they've seen in large areas of China now, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. fact that, say, the, the North African deserts are creeping south, creating yeah. dust bowls. So why has it taken people so long? I mean, lots of people obviously don't quite realize it, but why, why was this ignored? I mean, why did people think you could just keep sticking fertilizers or whatever on it? It's, it's partly because we don't hold farming up to the same light as we would hold up any other industry. Um, there's also, um, I mean, it's not just that lack of scrutiny and accountability. It's also um, 
just surrounded by, well, two mythologies. On the one hand, this very mechanistic mythology, inputs in, outputs out, that's all you need to worry about. You don't have to think about the complex systems. You don't have to think about it as an ecosystem. Um, it's, it's just simply a question of flows as in an industrial diagram. But it doesn't work like that because it's a complex system. So you're trying to treat a complex system as if it were a simple one. And that never works, regardless of what system you're looking at, whether it's society, whether it's a financial system, um, whether it's a tropical rainforest, whatever it might be. Um, and on the other hand, this um, bucolic romantic image of farming, which says we can feed the world with a storybook farm mm -hmm. and and we um, can uh, just uh, sort of do pursue what looks beautiful um, and and cross our fingers and that's going to be fine and the problem here is almost the opposite problem to the first issue which is that the yields tend to be really really low on in in traditional farms um, and um, and while we all love the pictures we also yeah. have to attend to the numbers and one of the things I'm constantly calling for in Regenesis is for people to become food numerate um, and so what we need to be working towards is, is farming, which extracts the, 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 the best of the new system, which is high yield, and the best of the old system, which is low impact, uh, although actually some of the old systems were really high impact, but to, to, to try to get the lowest possible impact with the highest possible yield. And there are some fascinating new approaches which enable that. Yes, well, we'll come on to those. I mean, think things like perennial wheat. But let's just go back to, I mean, it's always struck me that in the post-war period when fertilizers became very readily available and in a way farming became more industrialized, that in, in a sense, governments all around the world, we, we created welfare states, we said we'd be responsible for education, um, for health, for all sorts of things that were good for society, but we outsourced food to big business without quite realizing what we we're doing and that all the way through the big companies have said don't worry about this we'll make sure the food is there but in return we want a very deregulated system and that's how we end up with some of the incredible statistics that are in your book about how few companies control the food system yes on one estimate um, four corporations control 90 percent of global grain trade as well as lots of the seeds machinery um, chemicals, processing, packaging. Um, and it, it's not just that this leads to all sorts of injustices um, and all the problems that you get with monopoly, but it also makes the food system itself fragile. So mm -hmm. we talked about the how we made the soil, which is another complex system, fragile. Well, the food system is a complex system. And I think Perhaps the most chilling of all the absolutely terrifying scientific papers I read while researching this book were the series of papers going back about 10 years saying, hang on, guys, the global food system's looking very much like the global financial system was in the approach to 2008 and explaining why, in terms of systems theory, that is the case, which is basically that the nodes of the system, in other words, the large corporations, the large exporting countries, the large ports, um, have become super dominant, have become very big, They're always a dangerous sign in a complex system. The connections between them have become very strong, their behavior has begun to synchronize, and the four elements of resilience in a complex system, which are redundancy, in other words, it's spare capacity, modularity, which is the degree to which it's sort of separate, the, the different compartments are separated from each other, circuit breakers and backup systems, all those have been stripped out. And we've gone from a situation of stocks to a situation of flows. We have a just-in-time global food system. And, and, you know, everyone said, well, you know, once we've harmonized trade, once we've got frictionless trade around the world, everyone will be better fed. And yeah, there's an argument for, for that. But what it's meant is that these big corporations have said, well, hooray, um, we, everything's flowing well, so we don't need to keep any food reserves anymore. We'll just, we'll move from stocks to flows with the result that our food reserves are basically floating in container ships at sea. Mm -hmm. and, and those container ships have to go through a series of pinch points 
um, the Suez Canal. Well, we saw what happened to that last year when a big freighter got stuck across it. The, the Panama Canal, the, um, the Bab al-Mandab, the Straits of Hormuz, the Straits of Malacca, the mm -hmm. Turkish Straits, which are effectively closed now because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, this, th this alone starts to make the food system very fragile with the potential for the breaking of the food chain. Then when you look at how the world has polarized into super exporters and super importers. So for every major commodity now, it's basically down to four or five exporters producing most of the food which other countries are importing. And in a couple of those commodities, they include Russia and Ukraine. So you can see that vulnerability that that mm. begins to add. The whole thing starts to look very parlous indeed. Now, you, know, you can imagine the horror that would have been caused if the financial system collapsed, but governments were able to bail out the collapsing financial system with future money um, yep. and push it back into a relatively safe space. We cannot bail out a collapsing food system with future food. That's because, let's spell this out, that's because we simply don't have it. We simply don't have it. We, we haven't yet produced. I mean, you can make future money out of thin air. You can't. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> I am proposing to make food out of thin air, but that, 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 that might come later in the discussion. But but you, you can't you can't make it. You can't make it. You can't make it yesterday in the way that you can make you can make money. Um, and so the possibility of a sudden shortfall when that food chain snaps, which incidentally won't be felt by the rich, because whatever food there is, we will attract will with get. our strong financial power, with our hard currencies. Already poor nations, even in a world of great abundance, have been suffering massive price spikes and, and food shortages because of small disruptions in that supply chain, which have been amplified in the way that complex systems do as they're approaching a, a tipping point by shocks being transmitted across the system and, and getting bigger as they go. Um, and so we've had this really weird situation since 2015. The, um, the level of chronic hunger has been rising, even though the price has been very low. So between 20, uh, 2008 and 2014, the food price was very high, and yet the level of hunger was continuing to fall as it's done pretty well since the 1960s. Then, bizarrely, um, from 2014 to 2015, it fell off a cliff. Um, global food price index was uh, 115 in 2014. It was 93 in 2015. But that was just the point that chronic hunger began to rise and continued to rise, um, well, right to the present day. But throughout most of that time, between 2015 and 2021, the global food price index was below 100. In other words, food was really cheap and yet hunger was rising. How is that possible? Economists will tell you that's ridiculous. That can't possibly happen. But that's because... As the system has become more fragile and more vulnerable, the shocks which are transmitted through it hit those poor nations and, and cause those local price spikes because of disruptions in supply, mm. even when the global price is very low. And so that pushes up chronic hunger. Now, all this was happening before the invasion of Ukraine. So people say, oh, we've got a food crisis because of the invasion of Ukraine. No, no, the invasion of Ukraine has revealed the crisis. It hasn't caused the crisis. Yes, and what a, what a crisis it's going to be. So um, I, I want to now turn to um, the next part of your book, or, or the other, the big argument, book, which is, of course, about eating meat and the numbers of animals we have on this earth, which is, and I must say, always shocks, shocks me so much. And I'd now like to introduce Franny Armstrong's film that she has made, and we're launching this tonight. Thank you, Franny. And it's so exciting to have that, have that show everybody. And we will post links about how you can watch it again. Uh, I've seen it and it's great. And it's uh, Franny talking to George, or George really talking on the film, explaining his philosophies about meat. And it's filmed in the woodland, or largely filmed in the woodland near Franny's home in Devon outside Tilton. So can we now play the, the film um, and here it comes. People say we have a population crisis, and we do, but it's not us, it's them. Farm animals are now increasing in number about twice as fast as human beings. 70% of the birds on Earth by weight are chickens, turkeys and farm ducks. 
And while livestock are booming, wildlife is collapsing. Here in Britain, half our total land area, yes, half the entire land surface is given over to livestock grazing. Worldwide, 28% of the Earth's surface is devoted to it. And what do we get in return? Well, from animals fed on grass alone, we get, what, half our total protein? Nope. Quarter? Nope. One percent. Growing protein in the form of cows releases almost 200 times as much greenhouse gases than growing the same amount of protein in nuts. The 75 billion farm animals we kill for food every year cause more climate breakdown than all our planes, trains, trucks, cars and ships put together. The extreme climate events of the past few years, the heat dome over North America, which cooked the fruit on the trees and roasted the shellfish on the rocks, the wildfires in California and Australia, the great heat waves in the Arctic and Antarctica, the floods in Europe, in China, in South Africa. These look to me like the flickering of the Earth's systems. The world could be about to flip out of its current stable state the state which is perfectly suited to the flourishing of life and into a different one altogether. Would this new state be habitable for the living creatures on Earth today, including most humans? Unlikely. I'm 59, and unless we change the way we eat, I think it will happen in my lifetime. But I think there is a way in which we can feed the 10 billion people who will be on Earth in 2050 and prevent this apocalypse. Ready for it? Stop farming animals. Just stop. Brilliant, eh? The end. Um, no, hang on a moment. Let me explain. Everything humans have eaten to date has come from plants capturing the sun's energy through photosynthesis. And we either eat the plants directly or we consume the animals and fungi that themselves eat the plants. But now in Helsinki, Finland, scientists are brewing up an entirely different kind of food. Inside these tanks, protein is being produced by bacteria. The only inputs are water, carbon from the air, a sprinkling of nutrients, and electricity to split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. And the only waste product is water. I was the first person outside the Helsinki team to eat a pancake made from it. And the shocking truth is that it tasted just like a pancake. Humanity's favorite meat is a generic white protein. These bacteria can produce an almost identical generic white protein without the breeding and feeding and slaughtering of 66 billion birds a year. You can have something which tastes very much like chicken without involving the chickens. In fact, these bacteria can be selected or gene edited to produce any of the proteins and fats we get from eating animal products. The same molecules, just made a different way. And we wouldn't have the added heart disease and food poisoning and occasional pandemics that we get as a special bonus from eating animals. Growing protein this way uses 1,700 times less land than the second most efficient way of doing it, which is growing soya. And it uses 138,000 times less land than producing beef. What this means is that we can produce all the protein required by 10 billion people in an area the size of Greater London. And that would enable us to return three quarters of the world's farmland to nature. <laughs> yes, it's a big deal to end animal farming, and I expect to get no end of abuse for making this film. We all cling to the warm and comforting beliefs with which we're raised, the bucolic images of livestock farms that are imprinted on our minds by children's books when we're very young. So it's hardly surprising that our loyalties are to the aesthetics, not the evidence. I don't expect to see much pastoral poetry written about microbes growing in a vat. But truth is seldom beauty, 
and beauty is seldom truth. That was fantastic. Franny, thank you so much. It's just, that was a wonderful film. We're so proud to be launching it. And I know everyone will want to watch it and watch it again, because apart from being very beautiful to look at and very arresting with all the images that you brought in of lands that can no longer support life, it was also jam packed with facts. And um, I want to ask you, because I remember slightly having this conversation with you some time before, did George's book, surprise you I mean all the I mean you know an awful lot about environmental things and yet did you know all this about the food system no absolutely not um I read it a couple of months ago and uh, I was being surprised multiple times per page or certainly per chapter um and uh, you know George and I discussed us making a film about uh, about the book, but it was so packed with so many ideas that I said, could we just do the one idea, this idea of just ending animal farming completely? So that's what we decided to go for. And, and George, um, I can't actually see you at this minute, but I mean, I'm assuming that you're there. I mean, why are we so wedded to meat? I mean, I, I know that, you know, I've had conversations with supermarkets and, you know, Henry Dimbleby, who wrote the food strategy, he once made a, a whole Radio 4 documentary about how the British were wedded to beef. And it, it, it feels like, you know, man and animal in terms of eating them is, is a difficult one to pull apart. Well, we, we have changed our food habits radically just in the course of one generation. I mean, in Britain, for instance, we've gone from complete indifference to food to total obsession with it. Um, and, and in fact, there's been this global standard diet has spread around the world um, with tremendous speed where, you know, people all used to eat their peculiar diets and now pretty well, we're all eating more or less the same thing. So th there's no difficulty about getting people to change what they eat, but it's, you know, there might be some particular difficulties about about some of the asks which we might make but what we see and it's happened again and again through history are what I call techno ethical shifts where when a new technology comes along it can unlock the latent demand for ethical change um, we, we saw it for instance with um, with modern reproductive um, controls um, good, good contraception we saw it with the printing press and in fact the combination of the printing press and the replacement of parchment with paper and in both cases those unlocked a latent demand for sweeping change I mean it was all the demand was already there people have been pushing for it but they were greatly in, in, enhanced their, their call by the new technologies coming along now these new um, uh, precision fermentation technologies um, which could produce all our protein and, and fat on, on, um, uh, in, with a tiny environmental footprint compared to, to what we do today, they could be um, one of, uh, they could trigger one of those techno-ethical shifts because there's already massive growing disquiet about the way we treat animals and mm -hmm. the way that our animal farming treats the living planet. And lots particularly of younger people are utterly disgusted with what they find out about the animal farming system once um, that beauty myth has been dispelled and, and we get to the reality of, of what it's really about. And when something becomes amendable, that's when it becomes intolerable. You know, when we feel we can't do anything about it, or it's just, you know, there's no substitute, then it's sort of much harder to push for change. But the moment you see, oh, actually, there's a completely different way of doing this, and it's so much better, then suddenly people become really impatient for change. So can I just pick up on one thing that always, I think, gets thrown at your argument, and that is the, the type of farmer who is very much around where Franny lives, who has pasture-fed beef, uh, or, or, or maybe pigs, but certainly beef, sheep skipping around on hillsides, etc. who say, well, 
it's okay if we rear them like that. I mean, I think everyone in the world hates the idea of animals being in intensive care in any kind of factory farming. I think you could get a world agreement, but I find I come up against a lot the sense of, well, the nice grass fed beef is a good thing. It helps, you know, it helps fertilize the soil. It becomes part of the rhythm of nature and it's been there forever. Yeah, so the, the most damaging of all farm products is organic, fed, organic pasture fed beef and lamb. And the reason for that is the vast land footprint. Now, this is an issue which just al almost, uh, I, I mean, it, it's, it's mysterious how it's been neglected for so long by environmentalists. Land use, the amount of land reuse is the most important of all environmental issues because every hectare of land that we use for an extractive industry is land that can't be used for wild forests and wild wetlands and um, uh, wild savannas and natural grasslands, the ecosystems on which the great majority of the world's um, wildlife depends um, and on which our survival depends, on which planetary systems depend. Now, we all campaign against urban sprawl. We all hate urban sprawl, but that occupies 1% of the planet, um, whereas agriculture occupies 40%, and the great majority of that, um, the 28% of the planet, is for grazing land. And as the film showed, you know, that just produces 1% of our protein from grazing alone. So it, it's this tremendously profligate use of land. And farmers say, oh, but you know, we're, we're working with nature. No, you're not working with nature. Where are the where are the large predators? Where are the wolves? Where are the lynx? You know, we've completely eliminated them in the UK. In the US, they have this massive federal and state trapping and killing program. Um, to destroy their populations on behalf of, of, of the livestock industry, including setting cyanide landmines, which kill indiscriminately. They've even killed at least one person. Um, they kill people's dogs, they kill... I mean, it's just monstrous what they're doing, these cruel, horrible um, techniques for killing large predators. Um, uh, the minimum of, for what a regenerative program would look like would be allowing trees to return to formerly forested land. But to do that, you have to bring your stocking levels down so low that you're scarcely producing any food at all. And people say, oh, well, we could produce our beef like they do at NET, you know, the rewilding program in, 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 in Sussex. And, you know, it's, it's great rewilding what they do. It's terrible food production. It's 54 kilograms of meat per hectare per year. It's nothing. If we were to turn all the agricultural land in Britain into NEP, we'd produce 75 calories of meat each per day, one thirtieth of our calorific requirement, and nothing else. So basically, if, if that's the way we produce our meat, only millionaires will eat it. And yet we have this uh, self-deceptive movement among foodies and chefs and indeed some environmentalists who say, oh, we can do it less and better. Mm -hmm. you know, we can have less and better meat. Uh, but but you know if you are to get meat only from from systems like that, you know, you you can't produce meat for everyone. You'll only produce meat for the extremely rich. So so it's this massive program mm. of self deception. It's this agricultural sprawl on a huge scale, with a huge ecological opportunity cost. All the ecosystems that would be there if you weren't doing it, and a huge carbon opportunity cost because those natural ecosystems are far richer in carbon than the pastures that have replaced them. And if we're going to get through this century, if we're gonna stop climate breakdown, we need not just to decarbonize our economies as quickly as possible, which we urgently need to do, but also to draw down much of the carbon dioxide that's already been released into the atmosphere. And by far the fastest way mm -hmm. of doing that is ecological restoration. And that means basically using the land currently being used so wastefully by livestock grazing. Yes, that's incredibly interesting. Franny, you, you've always been someone who's communicated whatever messages around the environment and around climate change. Um, George's message on one level is, is fantastically clear. And when he argues it, you go, well, of course, but I know what we're kind of up against. So how would you, you've been a vegetarian for all your life, well, uh, funnily enough, uh, George saying the stuff he said earlier about the children's books and all that, I, it reminded me that I actually wanted to be a farmer when I was little. And this is what started my whole um, journey, as they say, because when I was 11, I persuaded my mum to um, take us on holiday to a farm in Wales. 
because I wanted to be, be a farmer when I grew up. And, and then my sister and I, we worked every day on this farm, getting up at 5 a.m. and helping with the milking and shoveling the shit and all that. And, and, and in a level, to a level, I loved it. But then um, my favorite cow that I got really attached to um, slipped over, cut her teeth, had a tiny little cut on her udder. And uh, I remember asking the vet, you know, it, it, is she going to go to the vet? No, I remember asking the farmer, is she going to go to the vet? And the vet said, uh, sorry, and the farmer said it would cost £37 for that cut to be sewn up uh, for, or for the vet to come. So she's going to go to slaughter now because she was going to slaughter anyway in five months. <laughs> and that was my introduction to or the end of my um, belief in farming. You know, I'd, up to that point, I believed that farming was what the, the, the uh, the books had told me and that was the moment I became an environmental campaign I became vegetarian then um and then yeah so it's funny actually I hadn't thought about it I, I've just made this film because George has written his book and uh, uh that's what triggered it but actually it's gone right back to the beginning for me personally as well which is really good um later I became a uh, filmmaker and again that was on the same issue because I was sharing a flat in London in the um, early 90s with my friend who was the president of the vegan society and she was saying that, um, you know, they wanted to make a video, but they couldn't afford it. So I said, oh, my dad's got a camera. <laughs> I'll make you a video. Um, and so I'd, I'd never got any video experience whatsoever. Um, but that, so that was the very first film I ever made. And should we, we've got a little clip of it. Should we show it? It's just yeah, funny. No, sure, it's sure. exactly I'd, the same I'd subject. Come back and um, talk about the alternatives, George, like things like perennial wheat and some of these, these things. And then we're going to come to questions and we've got masses coming in. So let's play the video and then come back and talk about some of the really exciting things that are coming down the track towards us. OK, I'm going on mute. It is estimated that 260 million acres of rainforest have been cleared in America alone to grow crops to feed livestock. That's about 55 square feet for every one of those. just left that bit on the end of the clip there Rosie because I thought it was funny there's no there's yeah. not even an email address if you want further info you have to write <laughs> so but, but I mean what what Benjamin Zephaniah says in that is exactly the same today and I, I I love the way he just flips that that burger at you I mean it's a it's a chilling statistic and it's probably even more land nowadays because the yeah. land has got weaker so George let's before we bring in some of the audience tell us about I'm really interested in perennial wheat and, and what that could mean for how we grow food. Sure. So um, this has been a dream of scientists for, for over a century to produce perennial grain crops. In other words, um, harvests that you can take from the same plant year after year, as opposed to the annual crops, um, which live and die in one year, and then you have to start all over again the following year. Now, uh, large areas um, covered with annual plants are, are very rare in nature, and they come about as a result of a disaster, like um, mm -hmm. a volcanic eruption or a landslide or a forest fire. Um, and then the, the annual plants can move in quickly and colonize that and reproduce quickly. And then the perennials, the long lasting ones, will come in and smother them and that'll be the end of it. So in other words, to grow annuals, you have to create a disaster every year. You have to plow the, far, plow the land or spray herbicides on the land, and then you have to pour loads of fertilizer on to get these little plants started. And they're very vulnerable. They're vulnerable to climate disruption. You, you have to give them lots of help along the way. So what if we can switch from annual grains to perennial grains and and finally is being cracked so the land institute in in salina kansas um, has is already working on a whole load of different um, grains it's brought one to full commercialization which is um, a rice variety now being grown with the help of yunnan university um, over um, thousands of hectares there and they've been harvesting the same um, plants for six harvests in a row, and they're still producing the same yields as annual rice produces. So it's a full on success. And look- Wait, wait, can I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Are you saying that this is a new strain of rice 
and potentially wheat that we we never had this before. No, they've hybridized um, a the annual rice with with a perennial species and got the sort of best of both from from yeah. from doing so. Now they're doing the same. Um, there's a plant called perennial wheatgrass, which they call kerns out and have a look at this. So here's here's the um, wheat. That's a standard wheat plant on on one side. Mm -hmm. And here's this um, perennial um, wheat grass called Kernza. Here are the roots. My gosh, that's amazing. Look at that. And, and what, that, what that means is that you need less fertilizer, you need less water because yep. it's getting its own water from deep down. It also is likely to be far more resilient to environmental shocks. So to give one example, they've also got a perennial sunflower. They've been growing it alongside annual sunflowers. They had a major drought one year. It completely wiped out the annual sunflowers. The perennials just sailed straight through it because their roots were down deep, they had tough structures above ground. So not only can we use perennials greatly to reduce the environmental impacts of farming, but we can also use them greatly to reduce the environmental vulnerabilities of farming. That's fantastically interesting. So let's just talk about the, the protein and meat alternatives, because I know you, well, I've seen a few of people who are proposing you're making alternative meat. Just explain how it works and mm. how, how we would sell it. I mean, would we sell it as something under a completely other name? I mean, I mean, I would love to get away before long from having to substitute meat. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a great fan of these meat substitutes. So most of the ones on, on offer at the moment aren't that great. They are improving quite fast. But, you know, there's all sorts of constraints, things you have to do to make it as much like meat as you possibly can. Now, that will become much easier with the microbial fermentation that we were talking about in the film. You won't need all that long list of ingredients. Um, it'll be much closer to meat. You'll be able to use sort of modern protein construction techniques to produce something um, a light meat, which is which is much easier to deliver. But I think it could also unleash a whole new cuisine of foods we're not even thinking about at the moment, just yeah. as the first Neolithic farmers to capture a wild yeah. cow weren't thinking about camembert, right? Um, <laughs> we, we, we're going to have a whole load of food emerging from this new food revolution, which is comparable in scale to the agricultural revolution in the Neolithic that we can't even conceive at the moment, but will radically transform our cuisine to make it healthier, cheaper, mm -hmm. and far more diverse. So we can, to shrink to a tiny degree the land footprint and the environmental footprint of the way we produce our protein and fat at the moment, not just from livestock, but also from soya and palm oil and a lot of the other damaging crops yeah. we, 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 we use. Um, but at the same time, sort of trigger this great revolution in new food, which could be a lot better for us and will grant us much greater food security. So, I mean, a lot of the like food sovereignty people are saying, oh, we hate the whole idea of this. You know, we want to see traditional people with horse drawn plows and stuff. But you know, we're seeing a global food crisis now, partly because huge areas of the world are dependent on imports because they don't have enough land or enough water or, or, or enough um, foreign exchange, um, whatever it might be. It's holding, uh, it's preventing um, uh, very large parts of the world from growing their own food. And they couldn't, they just couldn't. The, the, the physical constraints are too great. So they're reliant on imports, which they have to buy with soft currencies in a hard mm. currency market. But if we had breweries on the edge of every town producing uh, these, these new foods, um, they could be completely independent of, of the global system. Uh, we're talking about really simple technologies here. I mean, it's nothing is complicated here. It's basically just a refined form of brewing. It's uh, been developed since the 1960s when NASA introduced the, this breeding of hydrogen oxygenating bacteria in the 1960s for its space program. There's nothing very hard about this, and it could be autonomous. The major input is energy. And mm -hmm. of course, many of the hungriest countries on earth have loads of that thing in the sky which produces solar electricity which you use to electrolyze water to produce hydrogen and and so uh, the people who who are, uh, are most short of food can be most abundant in, in 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 food and it can be delivered locally by small local businesses without that whole global food infrastructure getting in the way so it actually will deliver food sovereignty, food justice, food security,
far more effectively than agriculture can. And great local jobs. Great local jobs, absolutely. Yeah. Rather than depending on Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland and all the rest of it with their outsourced labour force working somewhere on the other side of the world to deliver this food from somewhere else on the other side of the world. So, Franny, do you welcome all this new food? I do. Absolutely. Oh, even as George is saying it, then it's, I just think that's, I mean, from, we have to do something, don't we? We have to do something very, very big, very, very soon. Otherwise, it's curtains for us all. And, you know, finally, this is this is a solution, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yes, I, find I, mean it, I, suppose... I find it thrilling. I mean, unless somebody I, I can see all the comments coming in, unless somebody's got got a good reason why it can't work. I think we need to get going on it quickly. <laughs> Definitely. And um, I, I uh, actually, we, we need to come to the questions now because they're now over, they're now over 60 questions have come in. So I'm really sorry, we're not going to get to the wall. But let's start with where does the consumer fit into all this with their expectation of a cheap supermarket food from Dougal Horsford? Yeah, th well, thanks, Dougal. Uh, fact is actually that the problem that many people now face is food is too expensive or rather good food is too expensive um you know the un food and agriculture organization says that a a healthy diet costs five times as much as one that's merely adequate in terms of calories and even in a country as rich as this we now see so many people depending on food banks as i found at my local food bank uh, again and again people told me they would literally starve to death if it weren't for that food bank because they can't afford food now it's just not not just because of the price of food obviously primarily it's because of the price of rent i mean some of some of the people that i've i've been meeting they do two or three jobs mm. and yet still 60 percent of their income is spent on rent and again and again i heard the same story well you have to pay the rent or you get evicted you have to pay the bills or you get cut off the only thing we can vary is the amount we spend on food and so people end up eating really bad food uh, because it's cheap and and it's obesogenic so people are undernourished and yet obese mm -hmm. uh, like the worst of all worlds worst of all worlds, uh, exactly. yeah and 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 we have this you know it's not you know people blame it on a food culture and they say oh it's lack of willpower and it's people um, choosing to buy the wrong stuff no there's no choice in this at all you know the people i've been talking to if it weren't for the food bank all they would eat would be really rubbish ultra processed food because that's all they can afford to eat. And that's also pretty well all that's on sale in their communities. And unless they can also afford the bus fare to go to somewhere else where there might not even be a bus to it anyway, because it's all car dependent, then they've got no access to that food. You know, and so often, as, as with so many issues, it's all dumped on the individual. We've got a systemic structural problem and we individuate it and say, it's your fault because you haven't got the willpower and and you're making the wrong choices and and people respond to me you know when i speak to them this is not a choice if we had the choice we would eat differently we would love to eat fresh fruit and vegetables we would love to have a more diverse diet we don't have the means to afford it yes i think one of the saddest things for me in the cost of i mean the energy price rise has been that all the fruit and vegetables that we spent so long trying to get into feeding Britain centres are now being left behind because people can't afford to cook them. And that just feels yeah. tragic. Now, Franny, here's a question. I've got two really questions for you about um, following on from George's. This is from Sophie Swetman saying, we need to look at how food manufacturers are spending billions on influencing and manipulating people in, into eating ultra processed foods. Um, you work in the media and in communicating with people. I mean, the power of the food corporations and the money they spend, 97% of their advertising is spent on unhealthy food. I know this through working with Veg Power, and it is really difficult. And then they turn around and tell you, well, it doesn't really work because it's an individual choice. Absolutely. I mean, this was one of the issues in the Big McLibel trial that uh, both George and I were involved in in the 90s. And... Um, I remember the stats then were something like kids get, uh, you know, something like 50 adverts a day on, for junk foods, you know. I mean, how can, obviously kids can't um, resist that. That's, the adverts obviously work. So we have to get rid of um, the junk food adverts. It's absolutely, as, yeah. And another question here for list. you from Richard Walker is, and I'm interested in the answer to this too, why didn't you show some of the horrors of factory farming of animals in your film? Did you and George make that decision together? Uh, I 
felt like that we did show the horrors. I mean, it was all highly stylized, obviously. Um, but uh, there's a lot of, we were doing the sound mix yesterday and we were adding in a lot of screaming, knives, <laughs> blood, <laughs> splatting. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have made a lot of films on this subject and a lot of which uh, include the horrors of um, yeah. industrial meat production. Could, could I just add something to that? Uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of uh, concern about intensive farming and quite rightly too. You know, there's, we all know about the, well, we should all know about the horrors of intensive farming. We don't, of course, but, but a lot of people, particularly in the field that me and Franny work in, environmentalism, said, oh, well, the answer then is extensive farming, which means more land per kilo of food produced, which is an environmental catastrophe. And yeah. so, you know, I think what we wanted to emphasize was actually, you know, there's no good way of producing meat. There just isn't mm. a good way. And, and the way which we thought was good is not a good way at all. It swaps appalling animal cruelty for appalling environmental destruction. Yeah. So coming on now to a question from Rob Wise, um, I think probably for you, George, what you've seen so far, the new the Environmental Land Management Scheme, ELMS, mm. how well do you feel that the government is doing in shifting future farming towards what you're advocating? advocating? Well, and so if you accept the change won't come overnight. I mean, I think I know what you're going to say, but let's hear it anyway. Well, the first thing to say is that, that you could not have a worse system than the one it's replacing, which is the European Union's common agricultural policy, which is an absolute catastrophe. In fact, the one genuine Brexit opportunity is getting out of the common agricultural policy. Mm. And it's a catastrophe because it basically it pays people for owning or renting land. And the more they own or rent, the, 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 the more money they're paid. But that land has to be in what it calls agricultural condition. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so it doesn't you don't have to produce food but it has to look as if it's the kind of land which produces food and that means that if it contains what the rules call permanent ineligible features and you and i know as wildlife habitats you can't claim subsidies for it and so it creates this massive perverse incentive for the clearance of wildlife habitats and yeah. across europe it has destroyed hundreds of thousands of hectares of prime wildlife habitat. It's one of the most destructive forces on earth. It's a total catastrophe for which we've been paying. And all taxpayers have been pouring money into the hands of Russian oligarchs and corrupt politicians and oil shakes and, 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 and mining magnets and James Dyson and the Queen and people just because they own land. It's just outrageous. So the new system, which is meant to be the new subsidy system the UK is going to apply, can't possibly be worse than the one that it's replacing. However, um, not so much the government, but some of its backbenchers, unfortunately, in cahoots with the Labour Party, unbelievably, who have lined up with the hard right of the Tory party, are doing their absolute best to make sure that it's as bad as it can possibly be. And they're trying to strip out the, the environmental elements. I mean, even if it's not destroyed in concept, there's a huge problem, which is that monitoring and enforcement capacity in this country has been almost entirely dismantled. Yeah. The Environment Agency, Rural Payments Agency, Natural England, the rest of it, they're just totally toothless now. So, so even if the rules stay relatively good on paper, um, it'll still be a matter of farmers just ticking the box and getting paid because there'll be no one to check. Yeah, so I remember from when we, we did the Riverside about Tranny and you you had that statistic that a farmer in Britain is going to get a visit, what was it, every 265 years? 263 at the moment? years, yeah, once every 263. 263, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it's really chilling. And at the moment, I mean, included in the arms is no real beefing up of environmental protection agencies. Um, God, time is passing. So this is a just, a, I think, I hope, a quick question from Tom Gardner. How do the CO2 emissions of producing a kilo of bacteria protein compared to the CO2 emissions of growing a kilo of plant-based protein? Um, they're much smaller. I don't have the stats immediately to hand. They are in, in, in Regenesis, um, but, but they are much smaller um, because you, know, you don't need to be towing that machinery across the ground, um, doing all the ploughing, which requires a whole lot of diesel. Um, you don't need all those um, chemical inputs and the rest of it. Um, there's uh, likely to be less processing involved as well and less transport in that you've got you know, something which is, is, is innately um, smaller volume. It's closer to the final product, basically, when, when it comes out of the factory 
than than grains are when they when they come off the farm so so you in a whole lot of ways you're minimizing it but it is crucial that you use low carbon electricity to produce it you know you, you mustn't use fossil fuels to, to be producing the stuff because you do need uh, quite a lot of electricity i mean if all things were equal you would need to raise total global electricity production by 11 percent if we were to produce all our protein by that means but because it's going to be a general electrification of the economy um, and we hope at any rate and switch towards renewables mm. across the board and perhaps some um, new nuclear as well then what we're going to see is massive electricity surpluses at times of low demand um, because it has to be sized for times of maximum demand so um, most of the electricity that we require is going to be basically mm -hmm. there anyway it's going to be free to turn into hydrogen i mean not free in terms of cost but 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 free in that it's not going to be used so so the extra um energy requirement or electricity requirement will actually be relatively small okay um i'm going to wrap the next two questions up together because they're really good and they're probably going to have to be the last so thomas saraceno as well as someone called m fion so thomas asks who will own the technology which is really mm -hmm. important that we don't create a new Archer Daniels somewhere. Mm. And then Amphion asked, I'm concerned about the health problems associated with ultra processed food. How do we stop the food that you're talking about becoming the new Pringles or the new, you know, aisles of wretched crisps that have, yeah, yeah. you know, I, you, I look at them and I think they have no natural pr product whatsoever within them. And yet here we are launching onto a world which is the word natural is going to become very difficult isn't it and how, how we use it how we describe it how do we know that in fact we're not stuffing our face with more yeah. chemicals that sure. are very irresistible to our sweet tooth and all of that absolutely well both of these are excellent questions and they're closely connected you right to bring them together so 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 on, on the first part of the question um yeah um corporate intellectual property rights are a threat to life on earth um mm -hmm. yeah, in the existing food system um, and, and it will be the same with the future food system as well. Um, you know, the reason for that massive concentration of power is because of corporate intellectual property. They created all those mergers and, and acquisitions in order to concentrate that IP in every sector, you know, whether it's Google, whether it's Amazon, whether it's these new foods, corporate intellectual property should be weak and antitrust laws should be strong. And clearly that's not where we are at the moment, but it's what we should demand. And so given that this is the most important environmental technology on Earth today, precision fermentation, we should be getting in at the beginning and saying this must belong to us, not to them. Mm -hmm. Given that it's been developed almost entirely with public money at public universities, we've already blinking paid for it. So why should we have to pay for it again? You know, it should be open source. And, and, and if we're going to have this sort of blooming of, of small businesses around the world using this technology, then, then that's the way it needs to be. Um, so you, you're absolutely right to ask the question. It, it's essential and, and we, you know, but the problem with, with, with the, the, the mistake we've made so many times in the past is to say, because we don't like the power relations surrounding it, we don't like the technology. Yep. But what we need to do is to separate the technology from the power relations. And that, that's the same with existing agricultural technologies as, as well as future food technologies. Now, uh, again, you know, with the wrong companies in charge, you know, anything can be turned into junk food. You know, <laughs> they basically take food and turn it into something rather less than food um, um, in order to make it so hyper palatable to make us addicted to that, that form of junk food. And of course, that's a danger here as well. I mean, there's nothing in inherently ultra processed about it, you know, because we already use lots of fermentation products like bread mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like cheese, um, which aren't ultra processed. They're, they're sort of the, 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 they're, they're processed, but the minimal pr processing. And there's no reason why, why this should be in any way different. Um, but of course, it, it can be perverted by corporations right across the board. And, you know, so we need strong regulations. So strong regulations, strong antitrust laws, weak intellectual property laws. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very good note on which to end. Now, Franny, there's lots of people asking where they can see your film again. Can they use it to show? Now, we will be sending out emails with the link to this tomorrow with all the details of Franny's film. But I think that effectively from now, it is going to be available YouTube, et cetera. Yes, Franny? And we're going to launch it at eight o'clock. And if you go on George's Twitter or my Facebook or YouTube or any of those things at eight o'clock, we're going to spend it out. Yeah, you all have the... Uh, okay, well, you all saw preview. it first. 
and please yes. send it on because it couldn't Great. be more important and do get this um it's an amazing read and it will tell you everything you need to know and i i hope i i mean we've got 76 more questions i'm really sorry we can't stay on all night I and mean, we have never had so many questions i know how important this issue is to all of you um but thank you all very very much for joining us and thank you for being so involved and thank you very much to billy for showing the film for us and franny for making it and george for as ever well just being you and yeah. being so important okay. to all of us so thank you all and good night and we'll see you soon Take care. Thank you so much, Rosie. Thanks, Franny, Bye -bye. and everybody. Bye. Bye.